Hi, I'm Cheryl Kagan, very proud to be the Senator for Rockville and Gaithersburg. Welcome to this episode of Kibitzing with Kagan. And yes, I have a new appendage here. Uh, with me today is the wonderful Executive Director of Peerless Rockville, Nancy Picard. Nancy, thank you so much for taking the time to chat today. Good morning, Senator Kagan. I am very delighted to be here today. Thank you for inviting me. Um, I'm sorry about that new appendage. I know, right? <laughs> so it makes it a little harder to drink my tea, but I've got to show that I have my Peerless Rockville <laughs> mug. Uh, I love that. Yeah. So folks, a lot of folks watching may not be so aware of Peerless Rockville and may not have yet had the opportunity to meet you. And I love that you just described Peerless as a hyper-local nonprofit. So why don't you start with its history, starting in 1974, briefly what it has done and why it's such an important group for Rockville and for the whole state. Ah, terrific, I'd be happy to. So um, as you said, the organization started in 1974, a really a grassroots historic preservation organization formed by people in the community um, pretty much on the heels at a time when both historic preservation uh, nationwide was coming of age and getting roots and getting legislation behind it, but also at a time when Rockville as a community just was emerging from a really traumatic urban renewal time period. Uh, lots of buildings were being torn down, lots of change were happening, and I think many of the locals said enough. Um, so that's kind of our, 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 our far, far background. Of course, you know, we've been around since 1974, so 50 years off is not that far away for the organization. Right. Um, it ran at least 20 years as just a, a, a volunteer-led organization that started to really jump in to advocate for historic buildings, advocate for better legislation, but also then physically start to try to work to save buildings. And many of the... Um, uh, historic gems here in Rockville, such as Wire Hardware, uh, the Red Brick Courthouse, um, uh, Dawson Farmhouse, which is actually where I'm coming to you from today. Um, we're all, Peerless Rockville had a hand in helping to save, whether we physically did the on-hand work or we just advocated and worked with others to That's save great. it. So, so over gonna, the years, we're going to get into some of the projects. Uh, in a little okay, bit. great. Uh -huh. So um, so that was kind of the early background. And as the organization grew, it started to do a lot more and we got uh, started to collect things on the way. Mm -hmm. So we now have a digital archive, um, a, a collections library, a small library. We at work also as kind of a little community museum or historical society for the city of Rockville. And uh, we do a lot of education programs now. So a lot of history education, but other cultural programs and outreach to the community. Um, also do cultural resource work such as, you know, uh, section 106 work, for example, Say what that um, is. on uh, like the managed land study, you know, we were section 106 party and, you know, about other what section 106 is. Please. So section 106 is kind of the federal, it's, uh, it's federal law, it's part of federal law, and it's one of the ways that historic preservation gets teeth on the federal level. Um, Section 106 review takes place when there's a federal undertaking or a state undertaking that uses federal dollars. And it's really a way where uh, a time when historic resources are identified. Okay, so let's pivot for a second um, to learn more about you and how you got here. So you have a long history with Peerless, even as an intern, but why don't you talk about where you grew up and what sort of educational background you got that prepared you for this position? Okay, sure. I'm originally from Delaware County, Pennsylvania, which is suburbs of Philadelphia, um, a media Wallingford area, if anyone is familiar mm -hmm. with that. And um, I went to Penn State as an undergrad undergrad, studied business administration, actually, mm -hmm. um, took an urban planning class like my senior year, which I love, and literally at that point almost changed my whole um, trajectory, but did not. Um, I, Maryland, okay? I did later go to Maryland, yes. So um, I uh, married a, a man that was military, and he was army and then later infantry. Oh, still army, but MI. We had four kids. I stayed at home for a number of years. And then after uh, we ended up settling, big surprise with uh, military intelligence in Columbia, Maryland and came to Maryland 
um, in 1996 and have stayed since 1996 in Maryland. I uh, lived in Howard County for a long time. And once, as my kids got older, I decided to go back to school and I did go back and I got, I went to University of Maryland and um, actually uh, pursued graduate degrees, a dual degree program, urban and community planning and historic preservation. Uh, that's when I was first introduced to Peerless Rockville. And um, I have now been there as the executive director since 2014. Uh, I, I like to say really my various things that I did, including a business degree, preservation, but also years of church service, volunteer service, just, and, and just shepherding cats. Um, has actually served me very well as an executive director because in a small nonprofit, as you well know, you need to be able to keep a lot of balls in the air. So, <laughs> so before I forget, I just can you talk for a moment about Eileen McGuckian? I would love to. So um, Eileen um, was one of the founding members of the organization, and she still is one of just the treasured people, uh, really, truly, the heart and soul, I would say, of Peerless Rockville. She joined as a volunteer and later became Peerless's first executive director, and that's a role she had for over 20, I think over 25 years, and literally wrote the book of the Rockville, book. Yes. you know, <laughs> um, and, and, you know, had firsthand responsible for so many of the buildings saved and so much of the history um, and, and, and the legacy and, and the really the superb reputation that the organization has, not just locally, but on a state level, too. I'm feeling badly that I don't have my book, my Peerless Rock <laughs> book in, in my hand. Uh, I'm almost Portrait of a City is the name of it. There you go. I have it. I have it upstairs, actually. Um, so we've got to give the shout out to Eileen. But let's start with a really basic question. Why is it important to preserve our past? Why do these buildings, old buildings matter? Don't we want shiny, new, pretty, energy efficient and not these old, rundown, historic places? <laughs> so I think there's a place for a lot of different things in all of our communities, but I feel like there's a special place for historic buildings um, for multiple reasons. And one of them that, you know, is, is pretty relevant today is that what you mentioned, don't we want shiny new energy efficient buildings? Well, there's lots of embodied energy in all of our older buildings, and there's lots of resources that are there that just can't even be replicated today. Many of the older buildings were the first energy efficient buildings because they were built to take advantage of uh, daylight sighting and airflow and ventilation and natural materials. So there's a saying, popular saying in historic preservation that the greenest building is the building that's already built. Mm -hmm. so, um, so that is one reason for historic preservation. You know, another reason is that just, it's really a layered thing. In fact, I saw a really great little um, uh, post um, the other day that was done by, I'm not sure which university, but it showed the different la layers that combine in a historic building. So you have the energy efficiency, you have the continuity to the past, mm -hmm. you know, where you can really like touch, see, feel, and stand where, you know, in a place where the history is. And it really helps people to understand the stories that are around them and the stories that go before. Um, but there's also this emotional attachment piece that people get with a building that they grew up with or they remember visiting before. Um, and, and, and the buildings can adapt and change. And I think that's one of the, the things that will help peerless, um, not peerless, so just historic preservation and communities going forward mm -hmm. is being able to keep those resources and keep those stories, but keep the vitality of a place. And that's what I guess my last point would be is the historic buildings and the places in your community make, really help to make your community what it is and add to that sense of place. That's great. And make it unique. So I have a bunch of questions that I'd like to ask briefly about each of the projects that have been among the backbone of Peerless's work. And I think we probably ought to start with the Red Brick Courthouse. Okay, so the Red Brick Courthouse, um, you know, I think has been threatened at different times, but not seriously, seriously threatened. At one point it was on um, the chopping block, I think it, at an urban renewal, um, uh, iteration and the community kind of came out at that time well before Peerless Rockville even to say no this is 
that's too much. Because right. the Red Brick Courthouse, for those of you who are watching who don't know, is um, actually the third courthouse in Montgomery County, but it's on the site of the original uh, courthouse, as far as we know, uh, Courthouse Square. And it's in the center of Rockville, and it's a delightful building. Please come visit us someday at Courthouse Square. Mm -hmm. yes. um, so what happened is at some point, it, you know, it survived and it was used for various functions. But as the court grew and moved on, the building kind of got left alone. Mm -hmm. And when it approached its 100th year, there was a Friends of the Red Brook Courthouse uh, group formed in association with Peerless Rockville to help mon raise money and work with the Maryland Circuit Trust and the county government to refurbish it. Um, that was some time ago, so I think we're looking again to, you know, maybe reinvest, um, but associated to that, the great courthouse next attached to us mm -hmm. just had a really great opening ceremony and that um, a lot of investment by the county that we, you know, that was threatened a couple of years ago, and we said, no, rethink it, yeah. and they did, and it's reopened, and it's a great renewal story. Excellent. So let's talk about the outside. So the inside, they always have, there are exhibits and your office space, and there's a lot to offer inside the Red Brick Courthouse, in, including a beautiful courtroom upstairs where I've hosted concerts even. Uh, but let's talk about outside. Um, there's a beautiful fountain, and I got to be one of the judges for picking the artwork there. But there was also the Confederate soldier just outside and adjacent to the Red Brick Courthouse. Talk about historic preservation and whether that's ever sort of a conundrum for Peerless and other historic preservation groups. Sure. The outside, um, as you mentioned, is a beautiful place. It's it's one of the prettiest spots in Rockville. I'd like to say the fountain is lovely and it's ever changing. Um, one of the exhibits I always want to do is the view from the courthouse because we have images of it over the years, so it has been over ever changing. Um, so there's the fountain, lovely greens, and there's actually a 9-11 memorial on those grounds as well. Um, but you brought up the Confederate statue, so I do want to speak to that. That was really one of the most difficult things I think I encountered. Um, in this position, and it was early in as my executive, uh, being an executive director, uh, mostly because there is a value to saving and preserving these artifacts. And um, that was really hard because of course, you know, it was, it was threatening to people and it was very emotionally upsetting to people, um, especially when the attention was brought back to it. It existed there for many years, kind of laying low without a lot of of attention and then but once it was a lightning rod that's what it really became mm -hmm. was a lightning rod mm -hmm. and we did advocate for keeping it on the courthouse but only on the condition that it had interpretation and the stories would be told mm -hmm. um, and that we could maybe even do an exhibit on the grounds to, to really tell the full story because the story the truthful story really wasn't out there Mm -hmm. um, that wasn't the decision that was made. And, you know, in retrospect, it was probably the right decision to 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 move it on along somewhere else. Um, but I think we continue to have to find that balance between keeping what's not just good of our past, like we can't just keep the good feel good stories. We also have to share um, the difficult ones, which is one of the reasons why we did our exhibit, which is inside the courthouse, which is called Forging Freedom, Endurance, Escape, and Rockville's Underground Railroad, because we look at not just stories of slavery, but also the endurance of the Black community in Rockville, but some of the difficult stuff like escapes and also slave trading that took right, right place right in the city, as it did in many cities in the South. Right, right. Thank you for mentioning the Pocket Park in uh in memory of the Montgomery County residents who were killed on September 11th, 2001, including my childhood friend, Todd Rubin. And oh. folks who haven't wandered through there will be touched by, the, by that and find that a, a nice little oasis, so. It is definitely that. Yeah, let's pivot to another, another project. Um, let's talk about uh, wire hardware. Uh, and I remember being inside and volunteering and cleaning up that, so. Where is that and what is that? Why is that important? So wire hardware, boy, I wish I was around for that 
preservation project because that just sounds like such a lovely hands-on and everybody has wonderful who participated still come to me and tell me you know about it so wire hardware is um uh the last remaining uh, 19th century commercial built storefront in rockville and it's a lovely little storefront with the plate glass windows where you could have the little storefront display but it's kind of in its own little island. Um, it's near St. Mary's uh, Historic Chapel and the restored b &O Railroad Station um, in Rockville in kind of a little, um, a little niche area near, not far from the Rockville Metro Station. And um, it was saved uh, really in a uh, peerless Rockville stepped in and uh, raised money, but really raised awareness and got people involved. And ultimately it was a win, we, you know, Peerless acquired the building uh, pretty much long enough to slap a lot of historic preservation easements on it um, <laughs> to protect, with the Maryland Historic Trust. And I don't mean to say that in a derogatory way, but it is a tool that we use to protect historic properties. Um, and that building is unique because it has an interior easement that protects the inside as some of the features of the inside as well as an exterior easement. And the interior easements are or are, are more unique and harder to come by. Um, so then um, as Peerless normally does, I actually sold the building to an owner that would purchase and um, you know, agree to abide by all of the easements. So it is still protect, protect, protected today. And it's a wonderful building and used commercially. I mean, it's a, yeah. So. Used commercially. I'm not sure what it is right now, but there is a really cute little story that I, if you will, let me just one minute. Um, I know when they were first working on it at one point, there was a window display and it had all hearts. And I think it was done around Valentine's Day, but it was a, we love wire hardware. And there was a big heart in the window and everything. This was way before my time. And it was a long time ago. And we have a very special uh, volunteer, Winnie Herman, who has been with us for yeah. many, many years. <laughs> and anyway, she's in the picture and Eileen McGuckney might also be in the picture, but it's um, very much a heart bomb thing. But if you ever see preservation, that's become a thing over the years to kind of we love or places that matter and to heart bomb, you know, old places that we love. Well, every once in a while, Preservation Maryland will give a shout out to Wire Hardware and Peerless Rockville and they'll say, this is the original heart bomb. And they'll mm -hmm. show like a 1980s picture so Love that it. that's the story when you see a heart bomb think of wire heart hardware fantastic. so there are at least three more projects i want to talk about briefly let's talk about uh the montrose school which is uh, amazing actually the montrose school is amazing it's a 1909 was originally a two-room schoolhouse mm -hmm. um actually it's one of the last remaining resources in what was the Montrose community here in Montgomery County, which is actually just south down Rockville Pike um, from Rockville. So right outside the Rockville boundaries, it's kind of North Bethesda for those of you who might know the area. And um, it expanded pretty quickly to be a three room school. And um, it was active for Montgomery County residents till the, for, through the 50s. And then it was acquired by the school system and used for special education for a while before moving um, to the county and then ultimately to the state highway administration because they wanted the land for uh, what actually was gonna be the part of the inter-county connector. Mm -hmm. It ended up going somewhere else, but that's what it was originally for in 1979. And in 1979, it was one of Peerless' very first projects. They came in and said, no, 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 you can't demolish this 1909 schoolhouse. We want it to be saved. So um, the organization worked to with the county and the State Highway Administration to save the building. And what we actually were able to do was obtain ownership of the building itself not the land, but the building and um, fix it up. It was in very bad shape at the time, but fix it up. And we've now owned it since 1979. So for over 40 years, and we've had various tenants in there, but for the last 20 plus, it's been used as an early education center, which we really love because it's reuse yes. in its intended use. Yes. So um, and we, so it's, it's, Senator Waldstriker and I are working with you 
now to with the State Highway Administration. Yes, and uh, we so appreciate your your assistance. So what we're trying to do here is we we own the building but not the land, and um, the land has been determined. Um, that it's not something that the state can really use. It's a National Register protected property. And they're, they're, so we are now kind of working through the negotiation process to see how our small nonprofit can get um, really rejoin that historic property and the building under one ownership yes. so that we are able to really secure needed repairs and, you know, just we'd like to see this as an education center, you know, for the next hundred years. Yes. So your help is very much appreciated Absolutely. in that way. So let's pivot and talk about Frida's Cottage, which just won national recognition. So yes. let's say who Frida was, where the cottage was, why it's important and why it got, uh, why it is becoming the very first Rockville uh, property to get national recognition. Okay, yes, super excited about this. So um, what we call, well, we know this as Frida's Cottage is has actually just this January become a National Historic Landmark, which as you mentioned, is the first in Rockville and it's only the seventh in all of Montgomery County. The, the National Park Service um, has labeled it the Frida from Reichman Cottage, which is appropriate because it was built as and served as the home for Frida from Reichman. Um, Frida was a wonderful and amazing woman. Let's just and, place and, it in Rockville for a second. It's, yeah, so I was just going to. That's not Lodge. Okay, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, so so she, Frida actually came, um, Dr. From Reichman actually came to Rockville because she was brought on to be a staff doctor at. Chestnut Lodge Sanatorium. And if you um, live in Rockville or Montgomery County, you're probably familiar. This was um, originally built as a hotel and during Rockville's kind of hotel era as people wanted to escape DC and come out to the country, which it's not the country anymore, but it was the country. And um, that, you know, through a downfall of economic reasons that kind of didn't work out long-term, but it became, it was purchased by a doctor who wanted to open a sanitarium, uh, which he did. And really um, the first, um, Mr. Bullard ran the sanitarium. And then when he passed, he passed it on to his son. And his son really wanted to grow a nationally recognized mental health institution. And to do that, he he looked kind of out for the perfect person that could help him do that. And what he found was Frieda Fromm Reichman, who actually was living in Nazi Germany as a Jewish woman and a doctor and in a very difficult situation. And so she actually, I mean, I don't like to say escape, but you know, pretty much she did. She was a refugee from Nazi Germany uh, who had ran her own sanitarium in Germany and came with uh, amazing skills. She was actually married to Eric Fromm. So mm -hmm. that's a, you know, another famous psychiatrist, uh, uh, sorry, uh, another famous name in the psychiatric field. Mm -hmm. um, and Frida's specialty was really dealing with uh, patients with severe schizophrenia. Uh, she developed um, teachings and methodology that became known uh, nationally and internationally. And still today we get uh, requests for information um, about her life from London, you know, Germany and other parts throughout the world and all around the country. Um, so what happened is uh, one thing that Frida really wanted here in the States in her new home was a home of her own. And she was being heavily recruited by some other hospitals. And uh, Dr. Bullard realized he could just build her a home here on the hospital grounds. And that's exactly what he did. Mm -hmm. And he hired a leading Washington DC architect and a leading local, local builder to build her a small home, a small cottage. That was a mere steps from the grounds of the, the Chestnut Lodge Hospital. Sadly, Chestnut Lodge uh, burned in 2009 and was a total loss to the community. Um, but Frida's Cottage yeah. survives, um, as well as there's a few other outbuildings, but Frida's Cottage is really yeah. survived. 
Um, Peerless Rockville was the lucky recipient of the building when um, some of the land was sold off for a development. The developer actually deeded the cottage and a nice generous donation to Peerless Rockville to restore it so that we were able to take it back um, to how it would have as close as possible to how it appeared when Frida from Reichman lived there. Right. So yep. it's great. We need to we need to start to wrap up and there are so many more questions I have for you. Um, <laughs> uh, but I know I'm taking a bunch of your time. Let's talk uh, briefly about cemeteries, which was always um, which has been Eileen McGuckian's one of her passions. Oh, yes. <laughs> about about um, about cemetery preservation. Cemetery preservation is very important and it also can be very difficult. You know, uh, you're not bringing old cemeteries particularly, you know, there's been a de debate for many years. Do you call attention to them? Do you not call attention to them? Sometimes calling attention to them brings vandalism, awareness, but when you don't, they're forgotten and they, they fall into just overgrowth, um, and people move on, you know, uh, we all love the cemetery where our loved ones are, but when we all start to move on and the years go by, um, they can be forgotten. Yeah. And I think it takes a real advocacy and it can't be individuals. It really has to be, I think, joint nonprofits, governments, individuals, businesses working together to protect. There's a lot of information to be had from cemeteries. And one of the things that's been so difficult lately is of course the recognition that many of our African-American cemeteries have been disproportionately neglected and affected. And that's probably the biggest challenge right now in cemetery preservation. Thank you for that. Uh, so two quick questions. How does Peerless Rockville work with our county historic preservation question uh, organization? And second, how can people who are interested in historic preservation get involved with Peerless? Okay, great. So yes, our friends at the Mon at Montgomery History, the Montgomery County Historical Society, they are right down the street with us here in Rockville. And um, so while we have that kind of hyper local focus on Rockville, we also do do a lot of county focused uh, education, particularly because Rockville is the county seat for Montgomery County and we're housed in a county building. Mm -hmm. um, so we share a lot of the same mission with the with Montgomery history and we tend to work with them on uh, partnership programs sometimes educational programs sometimes walking tears tours and we have a lovely relationship and if you are looking for anything county history outside of Rockville they're a wonderful group of people and you know I would encourage everyone to reach out I got to say if you're that I I had a kibitzing with Kagan episode with Matt Logan, the director. So we had a good chat and people can find that and watch. And I'm sure you guys had a lot of fun knowing the two of you. I'm sure you both had a <laughs> lovely time. Um, so yeah, so you can get involved there, but in, if you'd like to get more involved with Peerless Rockville, we have different ways. Um, we have in-office volunteers, which has kind of been on hold, mm -hmm. but we're starting to get back to that. We have um, people sometimes that will help us with our archival collections, maybe mm -hmm. cataloging, working in the library, researchers, if you like historic researches, research, deed research, genealogical research, we do a lot of that. Um, we have walking tours, but we also have um, sometimes home tour events and larger events where we'll look for volunteers from the community. Um, cemetery cleanups happen, and um, we've not had a good hands-on preservation project recently. We wanted to do a cleanup at Montrose School during the pandemic, and we did have a very small group, but we hope to be able to open that back up to to a larger segment of the population as, you know, social distancing requirements, you know, ease a little bit. Mm -hmm. But definitely uh, we welcome volunteers of all kinds. And we also love to hear your stories as a community. And we love to um, share those stories. So we have lots of uh, volunteer speakers, presenters and things that um, we're able then to share your work and your stories with the larger community. Fabulous.
Fabulous. Well, Nancy Picard, Executive Director of Peerless Rockville, uh, I am grateful for your time. And it is now time for us to go to our fast five, five quick questions. To, okay. To throw <laughs> some stuff at you here. So question number one, uh, did you pick up a new hobby during the coronavirus? And what was it? So I, I wouldn't say it's a new hobby, hobby, but I did return to running a little bit again. I've never been a big runner, but I kind of decided I'm going to try a 5K. I did that. And I literally just managed a 5K this week. I finished it not at a race, just for myself. And um, that's great. I'm really happy with that. It's made me feel so much better. Um, because of your connection to the humanities, I'm very curious. What is your favorite museum in the DC metro area? Oh my goodness. I, I, that is very, very difficult. I love them all. I mean, I just, I feel like I'm always drawn to the American History Museum. I just think I just you always see something new there. They do all the Smithsonian institutions are just so wonderful, you know, and everything. They're just so thorough, so professional um, and inspirational. I know that's kind of an old standby, but it still just is one of my favorites. Perfect. Question three. If you could travel in time, backwards in time to any decade, when would you choose and why? Oh, wow. You know, I used to think I'd like to go back kind of um, mid 19th century, you know, just Civil War era to kind of understand it. But I just feel like that as I've learned more about it, so much strife, so much stuff going on that I just I, I just don't know that I'd, I'd want to do that. I probably... I think I'd like to go back kind of to the Gatsby-esque, you know, era, you know, some, some, some fun, some, some parties to, to really see what was it really like? Because okay. I think we um, idealize this time um, and we think it seems so fabulous. And of course, you know, it wasn't, but it would just, the energy seems like it was a fun energy. So that right. would be a good time. Question four. If you had a platform where you could speak to tens of thousands of people and communicate anything that's most important to you, what would you say? You know, I, I, I think I would say to people that, you know, believe in yourself and, and, and believe in your values and stick to your values and that um, just mental health is so important. But, but, but your brain is, is a powerful tool to use. And, you know, um, remember that and just resilience. I've been through kind of a lot personally in the last five years. And, you know, we all have those reserves. And I think, you know, use them, grow and reach out. You know, I think um, I don't do a lot of with mental health awareness. Um, if I think I had more time in my day, you know, I probably would. Um, I just, that's kind of my platform and I focus that way lately in the last couple of years, just internally. And, um, it does work. People believe in yourself. Yes. That's beautiful. <laughs> Thank you. That's perfect. The last question, Nancy Picard, the one that I ask every guest on. Oh no, I'm worried. Okay. She seems too excited. You seem. <laughs> uh, what is your hidden secret superpower? What is a stellar Ooh. talent you have, something you're really good at that most people can't do? Uh, you know, I, I would say, uh, my kids would argue um, with this, but I would say that I'm really pretty good at figuring out technological things. Like, even if they don't come with it, you know, as I've gotten older, if I put my focus on it, you know, even with younger people in the office, oftentimes they're like, Nancy, do this because <laughs> they're just, I, I will... I will, you know, focus uh, dead on until I figure it out. So I'm kind of puzzles, whatever they are. That's what I like. So yeah. All right. <laughs> well, Nancy, thank you for what you do every day to preserve Rockville's past and to bring community together. It's great, uh, great chatting with you today. Take care. I look forward to seeing thank you. Thank you, Senator Kagan. It was very much my pleasure.